And um, then I'm going to hand over to Lila, who is going to um, take us through this session. We're really grateful to those of you who gave us um, comments about what it was you wanted to get out of this session. And just to perhaps kind of set the scene a little bit, um, we've had comments from um, people who've booked to attend around wanting to better support students and really recognizing that many ESOL students suffer from depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, people who feel that they don't have knowledge or practice in teaching people with mental health problems and who want to gain some knowledge of those issues so that they can be better and more intuitive ESOL tutors with their groups. Really nice sentiments coming through in terms of how you want to work with your learners. Um, people's awareness of an increasing number of students who've got mental health problems and wanting to better retain those students who are facing difficult mental health um, circumstances or symptoms and trying to learn at the same time. And about people wanting to have some defined knowledge, some kind of theoretical base uh, for good mental health in ESOL classes, really. So those are the kinds of things that people um, have spoken to us about. And we would welcome your comments like that and your thoughts about it during the course of the session. And at the end of the session, about a week's time, we'll send you a kind of evaluation questionnaire, which is um, a little bit a happy sheet, but mostly it's about asking you, did you get what you thought you wanted out of it? And we think it probably takes a week or so, although maybe a week of half term and you, <laughs> you might not... Um, kind of had time to practice it yet. Okay, so I'm just about to um, pass over control to Lila, who is now the host. You will see a very slight delay um, between her and I. And then Lila, you're able to share your screen and I'm going to yes. mute myself once I hear from you. Okay, do you want to Thank introduce you, yourself and then it's over to yes. you. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining me from Spain. I can't believe that. Thank you. I'm really grateful and, and a massive thank you to Katina. This is my first webinar, so I'm um, excited and excited, <laughs> slightly nervous. Right, so um, I'm going to bring up now my uh, presentation. Okay, um, so today's, can you all see? Yes, nod. All right, fantastic. It's a uh, it's on um, supporting ESOL and, and mental health, and I don't claim to be an expert, but I've been doing this job for more than twenty three years now. So I'd like to share my journey and and offer some of the strategies I've been using, and I'd love to 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 hear about how you have been using your own um, uh, tools and and strategies to support. ESOL students who um, have some mental health issues. Um, I don't view myself as an expert at all, uh, but um, I, I, and I'd love to hear from you as well. So let's get started. So I'm Laila El Metui. I'm an ESOL teacher by trade for my sins, and I'm also an education consultant. And my work has been over the last 10 years uh, specifically geared towards LGBT inclusion. And more recently, I've been um, devising a prevent radicalization training package for people in FE. So using the chat feature, can you write to everyone your first name, what you teach and where you work, please? So let's test the, the, the chat feature. So I can see that hopefully coming through. So can we use the chat feature and type in to everyone, first name, can't see anything coming through. So I know that we've got uh, Christina, welcome Esol from London at the WMC, the Camden College. And we've got Katina who works nationally. You're head of inclusion for NIAS, aren't you Katina? Yes. Who else have we got in the room today? I think if people are using iPad, it might be a little bit um, slower. Katina, can you unmute yourself if you want to chat? Yeah, it was just to say Katrina is putting her thumbs up. So I think she's probably okay. on iPad. So yeah. Okay. So um, I'll carry on then. Um, and Lalia, 
Do you want to tell us where you work? Yes, so you're a teacher. Okay, fantastic. You've got a lot of experience and you work directly with asylum seekers and refugees. Fantastic. Thank you. So let's resume the presentation. There we go. So um, obviously keep an open mind. Um, these are my ground rules. Allow um, um, people to have their say, respect everyone, challenge the view, not the person, which is common to all of my, and if you're on um, all of my um, sessions, and if you're on Twitter, the hashtag, if I'm not mistaken, is MHFE, which is mental health in FE. Yes, I can see Katina nodding, so very good. Um, so you can give your feedback on Twitter afterwards, if you wish. Right, so the aim of today's session is to contextualize the legal, institutional, circumstantial and societal settings for embedding um, mental health lives and issues within the ESOL curriculum. Hopefully, we're going to have a look at some strategies and identify some support for our learners, and you'll have the opportunity to reflect on your own practice. Thumbs up, everyone. Fantastic. So, I'm going to start with a little quiz, um, which uh, relates to the Equality Act 2010, which is the legal uh, framework for this. And there are nine protected characteristics, as you know. Can you name them all? Can you show me your thumb? If you can name all of the characteristics. Thumbs up, can you? Okay, mm, not sure. And there are eight red herrings. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to have a look at the 17 characteristics and see whether you can guess which ones are the nine protected characteristics of the Equality Act. And you can use the chat feature to comment. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. So we've got number one, age, number two, disability, size and heights, social class, gender reassignment, um, diet and nutrition, pregnancy and maternity, race, personal hygiene, sex, sexual orientation, financial situation, which should be a protected characteristics given the current government, accents, hair color, religion or belief, marriage and civil partnership, and wearing glasses, which um, Katina and I are both doing today. I don't seem to be able to see the chat feature. Uh, okay, so some people have given some of their answers. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Let's see how right we were. And these are the answers. So, number one, age, disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, number 10, sex, sexual orientation, number 11, 15, religion or belief, and marriage and civil partnership. Any surprises? Not size, but some countries looking at making obesity a disability. Hair color has been an interesting EHRC video uh, created by young people about bullying that uses hair color as a trigger. It's true. For me, for me, the Equality Act is just a starting point, really. Um, sorry, I'm just going to move this here. Yeah, the Equality Act is just a starting point. And I think the other characteristics which I've named um, are just as important and do have an effect on um, how students interact with each other and with us in the classroom. We also have the new Common Inspection Framework, which um, identifies protected group within um, its Common Inspection Framework criteria. Quality and diversity is no longer a limiting grade, but we still have to demonstrate um, that we do include that in our uh, curriculum. And the new British values, which I've put it in inverted comma, uh, which I prefer to call values of Britain rather than British values, but also make uh, uh, an emphasis on respect and tolerance, all background cultures, etc., which is really very similar to what um, we're supposed to be doing with equality and, and diversity. I think it's just a, 
another name, really, wouldn't you agree? Um, so uh, let's have a look at some very, very, very alarming statistics uh, around mental health. Um, and for those of you who are visually impaired, I'm going to read from Lila, the... we can't see yeah. your slides. Can't you? You need to share your screen. Oh. Again. Okay, I thought I did. Yes. So I talked about, I gave the answers. Did you get, did you see the answers? And then I talked about the new common inspection framework and equality and diversity and British values or values of Britain. And uh, we're going to have a look at now some alarming statistics. So a quarter of the population will experience some kind of mental health problems in the course of a year with mixed anxiety and depression, the most common mental um, health disorder in Britain. Women are more likely to be treated for a um, mental health problem than men. Um, depression affect one in five older people. Suicide, suicide uh, rate show that uh, British men are three times as likely to die by suicide uh, than British women. And self-harm statistics in the UK show that one of the highest rates in Europe, 400,000 population. And it also affects very heavily um, people in prison and, and ex-offenders. Only one in 10 prisoners has no mental disorder. And that's taken from mentalhealth.org.uk. Um, um, website okay uh, more stat mixed anxiety and depression is the most common mental disorder um, half but half the people with common mental health problems are no longer affected after 18 months which is quite interesting actually it's not something that we have for life uh, but it's particularly affecting people from lower social uh, lower poorer people so people with um less financial means long-term sick unemployed um and we're now going to have a look at some statistics for esol students so depression in ethnic minority groups has been found to be up to 60 percent higher than in the white uh population young asian women are three times as likely to kill themselves as white women black african and caribbean people are three times as likely to be admitted uh, to be admitted, and I can't read. Sorry. Um, and detained under the Mental Health Act. Two thirds of refugees have experienced anxiety and depression, which may often be linked to war, imprisonment, torture, oppression in their home countries, social isolation, language difficulties, and discrimination in their own country. Um, having a low income, being unemployed, living in poor housing, all of these denominators are very common amongst our ESOL students. Would you agree? I can see people nodding. Low level of education, um, all like associated with greater risk of experiencing mental health problems. Financial problems can both be a cause and a consequence of mental health problems. And there are three times, people with mental health problems are three times as likely to be in debt. Um, as the general population and more than twice as likely to have problems managing money. So um, some really staggering statistics here which um, ring very, very true to me. Um, and the last um, invisible characteristics which is linked to mental health is, is the experience of the LGBT population. And I view ESOL LGBT students as being a closet in the closet uh, so they have to declare their sexual orientation in order to access the right support, which that in itself is, is quite um, a challenging in another language. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of students who are LGBT from the initial background um, have had to hide their sexual um, orientation and or, gen and or gender identity fear of persecution um, in their countries. So... Um, that that presents um, even more challenges for us as ESOL teachers. Um, so for me, it's about not looking at mental health in isolation, but if we go back to the protected characteristics and the other um, suggested um, characteristics that I put in my presentation, um, it's not just looking at age or, or disability or, or race or, or sexual orientation in, in isolation, but looking at, at all of it 
as in one big package and they often cover more than one wouldn't you say so i'm gonna get you to type up a little bit more and i've got a few questions so how do you ensure that you meet the needs of all of your learners in class what strategies do you guys use how do you integrate mental health issues in your ESOL classes and just to prompt you consider initial um, diagnostic um, initial assessment and diagnostic assessment in terms of curriculum integration what resources do you use uh, what happens in tutorial how does that affect attendance and punctuality any things to be taken into consideration for exams and if you are a manager as um, some of you um, stated in the uh, pre um, event questionnaire how can you monitor that ESOL students are being well supported in within your teams do we have any managers today so I'm um, just going to give you I'm going to unshare the screen so basically how do you integrate and let's have a look at the chat Or maybe if you want to chat, because there's so few of us, Katina, maybe we could have this as a group discussion if people wanted to contribute chatting. I can't hear Sorry. you, Katina. Yeah, if yeah. people want to um, unmic, that would be fine while it's so small. What I'm trying to deal with is we've got several people emailing to say they can't get in. That's why oh. you've got people. So I'm busy trying to email around the back for those people okay. who can't get in. But okay. if people want to um, unmute uh, their microphone on the left, I think that'd be absolutely fine. Um, and it'll only be if there is somebody in a big open space that we might have to um, ask them not to do that. Katrina? Sorry, I can't find um, chart. I can't, I can't find anywhere to type. Oh, right, are you on an iPad or something? I'm on an iPad, yes. That's okay, that. so... Yeah, it might be that. I think for it to work properly on an iPad, you have to download the app as opposed to just join through Safari or something. So that's probably what the problem no. is in future reference. But I, I think I, it's okay, so you can give us your thought by chatting, like physically talking. Okay. So, um, sorry, I, I missed part of it because I was coming inside because it started raining, would you believe? In Spain, <laughs> in the rain. It's very sunny in London. So we were talking about what strategies you use. So how do you identify someone has got mental health issues and how do you support them in your class, basically? It's quite difficult because I teach um, mostly Eastern European people who come over to, to Scotland to work in the fish factories and things. And I don't have, we don't have a curriculum. We use the social practice approach. It's everyday, so things to help them in everyday life and things. So it is quite, a, it's quite difficult to really address things like that, especially with the language barrier. I teach them how to go to the doctor and, and sort of things. Um, so yeah, it's quite difficult, but we've got quite a supportive, we have quite supportive groups anyway. So there's, you know, you're saying that there's a lot of people who have depression due to bad housing and things like that. And we're teaching them how to get better housing. And how okay, to... so by having activities which are empowering. Yeah. 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 Very good. Very good. Lalia? Lia? Um... As I said in my introduction, I, I'm not a teacher and I haven't taught. Uh, most of the work that I've done has been on a one-to-one -one basis with some small group work around um, supporting individuals into education and employment opportunities. But a lot of that has been around um, supporting people to understand different contexts as well as as a, as a, as a professional um, understanding their context. So everything that is being said, 
um, kind of do a lot of double checking so that we are sure that we are always on the same page. And I suspect that is where ESOL is quite a crucial um, element of a provision that it supports individuals to develop not just the language skills, but the language skills in the context of their daily living as opposed to, um, I suppose, English or um, as a foreign language. Um, in terms of uh, understanding when individuals um, have mental health problems, that has usually been some form of disclosure um, that has come following a meeting or a number of meetings where trust has been built. And the trust has been built by basically um, giving information in a way that people can understand it, giving consistently um, correct information, but also doing what you set out to do, explaining why you're doing certain things so that people can begin to relate to you and then therefore start talking about issues that are stopping them, for example, from carrying their elements of the action plan that we may develop. Um, so it's through a questionnaire? Like it's not, a, not a formal one. Not a formal one. Very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to contribute by speaking, even if we can't see them? Yeah, I can see that we've got a few more people. We've got Bev in. Um, I know yeah. you do a lot of um, ESOL work, Bev. And um, Amy Dunkley, maybe you could unmute yourselves and kind of um, add your comments. Not all at the same time, please. Okay, perhaps they don't want to. In which case, if you've got That's any okay. comments, yes. add them to the chat, perhaps, and then, Lila, you can continue and I'll pick them yes, up from the chat. Yes, I will. I shall. For me, the, the thing that that's, uh, I have found the most challenging is how to identify in the first place that someone has got mental health issues if they haven't declared, which um, I'm going to use from now on after Katina's input rather than disclose because so I think it's a little bit more positive to say I declare I have mental health issues rather than I disclose there's a little bit of, I don't know, kind of shame element maybe. Um, so I'm going to share with you what I've been doing uh, with my students. So um, in terms of identification, there's obviously the initial assessment, um, which um, um, is um, what like a screening test to identify whether they're going to be placed in E1, E2, E3, level one or level two, and the enrollment form. And on the enrollment form, it, it states, um, it asks students whether they've got any uh, mental health issues. But I found that asking that question, especially with lower level, was really hard. So my question is now, are you, are you on medication? Do you take any kind of medicine? And immediately they, 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 they find that answer, that question easier to understand um, and to respond to so if they're on sleeping tablets or antidepressant then I know immediately that th that they've got um, some uh, mental health issues and then when I do the diagnostic one of the activity that I use consistently is the identity pizza are you familiar with that activity has anybody used it where we don't use language, so that can be used with uh, people who've got no literacy at all, and they have to draw, segment the pizza, and draw various areas of their lives. And I've had a lot of students who either like color it in black and say that's secret, or, or you know, a lot, a lot more comes through than just you asking questions. But and and if you do that, I repeat that activity throughout the term at regular intervals, and the pizza changes, and it just gives me like a snapshot of of where they're at. I love that activity. I highly recommend it. Um, that was taken from Mike Harrison's blog, but I think it comes from Reflect Esong. So. Um, Asking them if they're on medication is a good way. Getting them to draw their life. It could be the river of my life uh, from Reflect Soul or doing the identity pizza. Um, then in terms of once we've identified that they've got some needs, then there's loads of strategies that I've used in terms of supporting the students. So from classroom setting and, and management, I let them pray at the back of my classroom. If they want to remove their shoes, it's fine. It's about making sure that they feel really, really comfortable 
um, very clear differentiation strategies that I use according to their ability and it could be giving them easier worksheets uh, which are very achievable or it could be um, pairing them with someone who knows less than them to build their confidence so making whatever reasonable adjustments and I often find that people who've got mental health issues also have other kind of ailments, whether it's like a physical disability or, you know, headaches, back pain, that kind of thing. So comfort is a huge thing in my classroom. I like them to be comfortable. Um, a lot of confidence building activities, a lot of praise, a lot of encouragement, um, and uh, develop, developing their independence. So I use a... Um, a learning diary and at the end of every session I ask them what they've learned what they've liked what they didn't like and I really take on board their feedback it's very important because they know what they want and they know what they've learned and I often say well I'm not in your head I don't know what you've learned you tell me um, so that's really really um, good and sometimes I share my own experience of having been um, of having suffered from very severe dep depression a few years back mm -hmm. and the fact that I declare um, enables them to feel more comfortable about declaring their own um, issues. Um, I do organize a lot of enrichment activities outside of the classroom. So last week, for example, I took my learners to the Houses of Parliament, to the parliamentary lobby, um, and make them feel included, you know, um, empowering them by teaching them how to use public transport, getting them out of their comfort zone. And it's almost like, ah, oh, you didn't think you could do that. What else in your life didn't you think that you could do? So having like a really positive attitude. And I've put, yee it's about celebrating achievements. When my students arrive, instead of, pushing them to, to, to be on time. I actually celebrate when they're on time. I even do a little dance in the classroom and, and, and it really works. It's the same as um, when they speak their mother tongue all the time, rather than saying, speak English, speak English, sort of like breaking down going, right guys, for the next 10 minutes, we're gonna try just to speak English in the class. And then after 10 minutes, we all applaud and very good and then try to stretch it by 15. And do you know what I mean? So it's always more achievable and it works. And also the one that I drill in every lesson, everyone is okay. Absolutely everybody's okay. Muslim okay, gay okay, everybody okay. Man, old, young, woman. It's, it's, and, and, they start, and they start saying it um, afterwards you know when someone um comes up with a, 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 a discriminatory comment um the students actually say no 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 remember everybody's okay um and being very very positive um visualization is another strategy that i use where i visualize them going to the next level it's a lot of motivational um tools so I always say to them, you're going, if they're entry one, entry two in January, you know, and the fact that someone in authority can actually believe and see that they're going to make it, it means a lot to them. Um, this is a, a PowerPoint induction um, that I use at the beginning of every single lesson, because for me, um, inclusion, any kind of inclusion, starts from the very first minute they walk in the class and um, this has the nine protected characteristics and I elicit vocabulary. So talk about disability, talk about visible, invisible disability, religion. You can see there's a pregnant lady, an old lady. Um, there's, I think, a drag queen. Um, you can create your own, which reflects your learner and talk about respect and respecting everybody. Again, everyone is okay. Um, so that's what I use. Um, in terms of curriculum integration, I use a lot of narratives. I've, got, I've developed a range of stories uh, which develop um, reading um, skills, but also practicing at lower level, the present simple. Um, um, so there's a story about someone who um, is on their own and feels socially isolated. There's a story about domestic violence. There's a story about a uh, um, lesbian couple and the last sentence is her wife works in an office and all the things that, that, that it raises and all the issues that it raises. And I, I write my own stories based on the life of my students. So I interview and then I do like a best of. And they often say, oh, is that someone in the class? Which for me shows that I've actually got it 
and spot on. And for me, it's very, very much not about having a mental health lesson, but having a lesson which looks at what issues are affecting them, whether it's money problem, whether it's immigration, whether it's feeling lonely, whether it's not having a job, whether it's not having any money, whether it's about feeling down, whether it's about having a new baby, whatever is affecting them, just bringing into the class and unpicking and giving them the linguistic tools and ability to use that outside of the class. And again, everyone is okay. Can we say it? Everyone is okay. Can I see your thumbs up? Well done. Very good. Um, so I've got some resources here um, of websites which I think might be useful um, to you uh, guys. Inclusion for All is very good. There's the Equality Diary. From, there's a couple of NIACE resources here. The ESOL Citizenship Materials. There's um, uh, one chapter which is uh, Britain as a Diverse Society. So it, have a look at, it has a look at all the diversity that we have, which I think can be used for values of Britain, if you ask me or the British value from the Common Inspection Framework. And then um, the last thing which I'd like to cover is about dealing with challenging behavior because there's a lot of stigma, a lot of negativity attached towards um, people having mental health issues. And for me, as in with challenging any form of discrimination, whether it's homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, sexism, racism, any ism or any phobia really, it's about equip giving the tools to our students to express themselves in a non-offensive and respectful way. So eliciting the difference between an insult and an, an opinion and the difference between accept and agree. We might not agree with everything, but we have to accept we're all different and everyone is okay. Yes. So it, drilling that, that concept. So I just want to hear from you about what you gained from the session, what was new? Is there anything that you use yourself uh, which is similar to what I use? So I'm going to give you now the floor and hear from you guys because it's enough of me talking. So who would like to? Katina, any comments? We've got a comment in the chat from Christina Santos. Thank you, Christina, which says she teaches them how to register with the doctor, healthy eating, etc. But she's never done anything on mental health. She's only been teaching for a year. So it would be nice to get some more ideas today. Yes. Well, um, as I said, I wrote a story about a woman who was living by herself and she was missing her family and she didn't have any friends and her English wasn't um, very good. Um, and is basically, well, teaching them, you know, punctuation, paragraphing, um, um, all sorts of, of um, language skills, but also opening up the debate and, and getting them to talk about how they feel and if they can relate and what things comes up. And a lot of, a lot of the times when I've used my stories, the students almost always um, declare that they're on medication or that they can relate to the story or they often say yeah me 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 same you know so it shows me that i've got it spot on yes uh who is a dunkley hello just checking that this check will arrive yes it is arriving katina we you're muted so you need to unmute katina I, you're muted i've done the reply okay So any thoughts on some of the activities or do you have any questions about any of the activities that um, I've um, showed you? Do you use similar ones, different ones? Christina, do you want to unmute? There is a comment from, uh, can't download anything, it is, is a work laptop and I'm not an administrator. That's from Vincent. Uh, what would you like to ask, Vincent? Katrina? Hello. Yeah. yeah um, I've kind of approached this with some of my adult learners, um, discrimination. Not so much mental health, but looking at sort of um, homosexuality and um, 
Stephen, just coming from a different country and uh, what sort of abusive and what's not. And um, I find that uh, most of my classes, and this is a big generalisation, but homosexuality, that's, you know, that's a no-no and they don't like it and things like that. So I have to really go through the Scottish laws on, you know, sort of being abusive and things like that. What can actually happen to you if you do um, start verbally abusing them or physically abusing them because they are homosexual and things. Um, so yeah, um, there's a lot of discrimination where I come from and, and the companies that um, my students are working with, that there's lots of discrimination and illegal practices anyway. So it, it is really quite difficult. Um, and I'm afraid mental health is just at the sort of bottom of the pile for me to get through. Uh, but they're interlinked though, because you can't look at someone and guess their sexual orientation. You can't, you can't look at someone and guess whether they have mental health issues. Um, do you know what I mean? So they could be offending someone who's in that very room and not even knowing it. So it's very important that um, we as teacher give the message that it's okay everyone is okay and it's okay to be who you are. And yeah, um, I wanted to say that two years ago, Katina and uh, Naye under the Equalities um, Fund, Innovation Fund, funded a project called Educate at Prejudice, which specifically looked at integrating LGBT lives and issues within the ESOL curriculum. And we produced a series of teaching resources and lesson plans from entry one to level two, specifically on the theme of LGB and OT. And there's a fantastic video about one of my students from Kyrgyzstan uh, who um, um, was a, a lesbian and talking about her experience in her country it's two minutes and 28 seconds and it, it could be a really nice starting clip that you can use in the classroom uh, to show that um it is really hard for people um who come from a country where it's not accepted and it's not allowed lila could you i'm gonna break my own rules here could you um, make me the host? So you need to go into participants and make me the host. And I've just brought the video up. Um, okay. It be really good, um, given that mm -hmm. point. So, so how do I make you the host, okay, Katina? So if you go into participants, and then yeah, yeah. against my yeah. name at the far end, you can make me the host when it says more. I can't see you, Katina. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, more. Yeah. Okay. And then yes. it says make host. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. And then I'm just going to share my screen with people. And if this doesn't work because of the buffering, um, at least you'll know where to go to for it. So it's on the Equalities Toolkit um, YouTube channel on the website. And hopefully, what I'm worried about is the sound. So if the sound's terrible, do the thumbs down immediately for me. But hopefully you can see the beginning of this. Yeah, no, I've got a better version of it, Katina, actually. Have you got one on your laptop then? Yeah, but it's not from YouTube. It's from the Equalities okay. Toolkit, but it plays really well. Do you want me to bring that up? Uh, yeah, if you want. Yeah. So do you want to make me the host I again? Will. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, we're flapping around with technology, aren't we? There you go. That's over to you. So if you want to play it from your end, it's just, it's very short and I think it would do the trick. Have you got it there? Yeah. Is it better? Okay. Well, you need to share your screen. Ah. Uh. Can you see it? Um, there was always a slight delay. I can't see it at the moment. Uh, yeah, it's coming up. Okay, I don't know whether we'll get the sound. Can you hear the sound? No, we can't hear the sound. So, lesbians and gay men get married. In this situation, gay men often lead a double life. 
but for women, marriage means complete loss of freedom of movement and choice in who they can be. And there are cases of suicides. 14th February 2004, that day a group of students decided to celebrate the birthday girl in a cafe. But after two women kissed, the group was thrown out of the cafe by the manager. The young people decided uh, not to tolerate humiliation any longer. Activists began to meet in parks or their homes and so libraries was born. Libraries first project was to rent an office. After the group began to work, the situation of the LGBT community became clear. Violence in the family and homophobic violence. First activities of libraries was to open a shelter. At the same time, uh, same time the first transgender group started in Kyrgyzstan. Every week, the group met to talk about their lives. The most important issues were identity documents and hormone therapy. In Kyrgyzstan, it is not possible to get a good job without identity documents. But the situation in the country has not changed much. But libraries now actively works to help the LGBT community in Kyrgyzstan and also in all the countries in Central Asia. Uh, now the country has five non-governmental organizations working on LGBT rights. Certainly, there is more to do. But every day, activists make small but solid steps to, towards life without discrimination. So this is this is quite a moving video, and a lot of the themes that are that are touched upon. Um, um, are to do with suicide, um, being discriminated against, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which, um, if you remember the earlier slides on intersectionality, crosses over different protected characteristics. What was quite good as well, Lila, while you were doing that, is it freed up lots of people to make comments in the chat. Um, so we've got comment from Amy about during individual tutorials at the beginning of term. We have the opportunity to find out more personal details about individuals and so any mental health issues potentially come to light then. I've not done anything specific before. Um, Yaya, you've said in your experience people have different reasons for attending ESOL and other courses and isolation is one of them. And um, Amy again has said when we have discussions in class in preparation for say E2 SNL exams, I always do an exercise about what a discussion is and what it isn't which leads to interesting discussions on facts and opinion and debate and discussions. And she hopes that this settles, helps to settle the parameters and emphasizes that all the opinions are valid and there isn't a right or wrong. And Bev talks about why isolation can't be underestimated and working closely with students to get them involved as widely as possible. Yes, really, really valid comments. But, but for me, um, a form of discrimination is invisibility. I strongly believe that LGBT invisibility is a form of discrimination because it denies your entire identity and who you are and, and mental health issues, um, invisibility is in my book, a, a form of discrimination because you're denying a, a very important part of someone's identity. What do other people think? So it's very important for me to, to talk about it and bring it in the classroom, but not like as in this is a gay lesson or this is a, a mental health lesson, but talk about it in the wider context of what we're doing to develop their, their linguistic abilities and skills. I can see people typing. Anyone wants to comment on the video or any aspects of the talk for today? This is where we need an editor to come in afterwards and edit all the blanks. Did you get anything new? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to know if and how tutors work with other agencies and professionals to support mental health and well-being. 
with the with the uh, current cuts in further education, 24% cuts that we've experienced at the beginning of this uh, academic year, combined with the 3.9% cut onto JCP mandated learners, it, it has had a, a direct impact on student services and the support available in, in colleges. So um, the support that we get where I work in my college is very, very limited and it boils down to basically signposting onto other organizations which are stretched already. Yes, Katina, Hi, there's uh, a hand. I, um, I'm going to try and do it from here anyway, which is um, just to share my screen for a minute, because I guess the thing that um, occurred to me there was yeah. um, the place where we're exploring that um, kind of most at the moment um, would be the BIS Community Learning Projects and um yes i'm just trying to i thought um is there anna who was at the city corporation of london i thought she was going to join us today yeah, it would have been really not, interesting to hear not, not here um yeah but i was thinking that um it might be oh, sorry i'm just um having a little struggle with the computer um at the moment i can um, see biz at the top but in case um in case people haven't kind of seen it, we um, we do have these uh, 61 now pilots around the country um, that are all looking at how adult community learning can be used to support people with multi moderate mental health problems. And um, on the MHFE website, there's a kind of interactive map, but several of the pilots are very deliberately um, working around ESOL learners. And so, um, in fact, the project at Morley um, is particularly working with ESOL learners and one in Ealing where they're also working with learners who um, are deaf and don't have English and don't have sign language um, and have mental health problems. So they're kind wow. of looking at how they make that accessible. So people are learning English and British Sign Language, if you, if you like, at the same time. Um, and it's mostly um, women from South Asia and the Middle East um, in that group. So Fantastic. we will get some interesting lessons. So when you look at this, um, in particular, this cluster of projects around London um, and, and look into some of those, as they begin to um, kind of post their findings um, gradually, then that will be quite useful. The project is subject to a kind of big overall evaluation. So they won't be publishing, um, individual projects won't be publishing findings along the line of, um, oh, I don't know, you know, with this many learners and uh, things like that. But what they will be doing on their relevant project pages, like this one in Oxford, um, is they will give you some information about what their project's about, who's involved, who they're working with, um, and how they're getting on so far and who to contact for that. So people might want to kind of browse some of those um, and there are kind of special interest groups on the website that people could access. So I think that's probably quite an important place where we'll see some useful information coming through, partly because um, we know that, that groups that, sorry, it's tried to immediately send a message to that project, um, partly because we know that many services, mainstream mental health services, are not able to reach people. Um, I think we've lost them. you, Katina. Okay. Yes, and um, the other thing which I was going to say is that additional learning support doesn't really cover um, uh, mental health. Um, we're definitely where I work, um, no students below um, entry three um, gets additional learning support. Um, their, their funding pots has shrunk, basically. Um, so to answer your question is... Um, very much dependent on the uh, relationship that we've built with the local um, um, organizations which offer um, mental health support. Um, one issue, I'm just going through the chat room now, one issue we have had in my workplace is that the students have a minimum attendance requirement, 85%, and this disadvantages students with depression who are not able to attend every lesson if they miss more than three lessons in a 12-week term. They are withdrawn from the course. The tutors are between a rock and a hard place as they want to support the students but are required to withdraw any law attenders. Does anyone have a situation like this? 
have you tried to address this? Yes, is my answer to you. And what I've negotiated with my line manager, and it's written in the group profile as well as on the um, lesson plan and scheme of work, is I've uh, negotiated a certain... Um, um, we, we've got um, zero for absence and then A for authorised absence. So if the students let us know in advance that they're not going to be able to come, then it's okay, even if it's three on a row because they've got hospital appointments or they've had something. And in terms of punctuality as well, um, I don't mark them late. If they're 10 minutes late, I allow a 10 minute leeway. Um, and it's very much dependent on the relationship that you have with your manager. I they have to seek where I work. They have to seek the 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 um, teacher's approval before they withdraw. Over my dead body, are, gonna, are they going to withdraw any students from my class? I wouldn't allow the administrator to do it. Um, so maybe see, give more power to the teacher and let them decide who needs to be withdrawn from the course, rather than being an automatic thing. Because it's not it's not reliant on. You know, you need to know some people who don't turn up, they've got valid reasons. Bev is saying we manage attendance, attendance sensitively where we know the learners have issues. If we can arrange for work to be completed outside of class time, we can mark with an agreed neutral mark. And, and that could also be the way we, some people are looking at blended uh, learning models or online models or virtual models um, to kind of sort of like um, cater for that. Yeah, I, funnily enough, that's one of the reasons why we've been um, so keen to do this series of the Zoom sessions. And I was sharing this with Lila when I introduced her to it. Um, on these mental health pilots that I was talking about, we've looked at not only the, you know, because you're talking about a class that's full of people who um, have anxiety or depression in particular. And so um, we've said that actually using something like this can enable people to be in the classroom when they're not in the classroom. So if your depression or your anxiety means that you can't get out the door, which is often the very big problem for people, you can get through that door and come in virtually. So there's nothing to stop you setting this up occasionally within the classroom. And what I found really useful is if you do that, if the group encouraged the person to come again next week, or I've seen people say, well, I'll meet you at the bus stop halfway between and we can make the next step together. And so what you begin to see is that kind of empowerment of your learners as a group in the same way. But we've also been looking at it for if the weather's bad, how can we enable people to come? And that's not, I mean, these, these pilots are not Ofsted inspected and they're not subject to the same attendance um, that the rest of your provision is. We're doing that because if you have mental health problems that are mild to moderate, so depression, anxiety mostly, they are socially isolating conditions. They make you withdraw and they make others withdraw from you because you become quite difficult to be around. So we're saying we want to build these things in because getting outside that door and getting to be with other people is really important. And if you can be indoors, but in the world still, then in terms of that managing social relationships, it's absolutely critical. So I think, funnily enough, not for all the usual digital learning reasons, but for mental health reasons, I really see that bringing the digital into your ethos classrooms in this way could be really, really valuable. And this particular software is free. So also your learners, if they have Wi-Fi, they could use this for free. They can you know, easily contact each other, but they could attend your classes and because you've seen the screen sharing and things, they could make contributions in the same way. So you're not, you're, you're making blended learning seriously blended for all the right reasons for mental health. So I just chuck that one in. Yeah, thank you, Katina. And also, um, I remember when I worked for a very small um, uh, voluntary organisation called ELAT, they used volunteers to actually go and pick up people who couldn't come to the classroom and, and literally bring them to the class. And then they would bring them halfway and then they wouldn't go and pick them up until I had one particular lady who who very rarely went out the house unless she was accompanied. And by the end of the term, she actually managed to take the bus and come on her own. Uh, we've got a comment. Um, around attendance and punctuality again. Yes, we have E for excused absence, but zero and E are counted the same as when it comes to the number crunches. There are no valid excuses according to the executive board at the college. They say they are Ofsted's 
line the tutors have very little room to maneuver when decided whether to withdraw or not unfortunately well by law they are required to make reasonable adjustments to enable people to um, attend and achieve so you can use um, the equality act as your ammunition and i have on numerous occasion fought that battle with my previous line managers saying you are required by law under the equality act 2010 to make reasonable adjustments so reasonable adjustments for me is allowing some lateness and some absences because that is the nature of the beast uh another comment I guess just to add there that yeah uh, the definition for the act would be a condition that's likely to affect somebody for 12 months or more and because mental health and anxiety yes depression are both fluctuating conditions then it is likely that it may affect people the difficulty quite often is your learners with mental health problems may be coming to terms with that and may not want to be seen as disabled. So you might find in your ESOL class, there's a whole unpackaging around disability to be done before you can actually make the kind of flexible adjustments. But, and, and so again, I think sometimes if that's difficult for people, then you know, you're back to the role of equality and diversity in your ESOL classes, aren't you? Yes, yes, absolutely. And which is why I said bring in the identity pizza, bring in, you know, various activities which are non-threatening, which will enable a declaration. Um, yeah, yeah, you said getting learners to understand the impact of their absence on their learning, their peers, the tutor, etc. It's helpful. I would beg to differ, actually. I think most of the students who suffer from mental health are aware of the impact and it makes them feel really, really bad. And I think you have to tread really carefully if you're giving them a hard time saying you're late, do you realise the impact it has on other people? Um, and this is from my own experience um, because I think they're aware they don't want to be late. Most of them, I'm telling you, absolutely sure. Um, IAG sort of can provide references for volunteer work and other courses that is based on attendance. Understanding this can improve their attendance. Yes and no. I agree with you. We have to try to get them to be on time and attend regularly. But really, from direct experience of having mental health issues, it's like saying to someone in a wheelchair, saying, why don't you run? Why don't you run? Go for a jog. Or, or getting someone in a wheelchair to, to climb a flight of stairs. It's physically impossible when you're in that dark place. So all I can do, and my, my strategy is, you've made it on time, well done, try again next time. But not the whole guilt trip about, do you realize the impact and how negatively it's, it's impacting? Um, okay. Do you want to un unmute your microphone, Yalia, so we can carry on this chat then? I don't think that learners may think that their attendance does not matter. That's not been my experience. The, the popular ESOL students are a different breed altogether. They love learning. They love coming to the, they are so grateful to be receiving an education. They respect their teacher above and beyond. I've worked with NEETS, native speakers, 16 to 18, and that's a completely different kettle of fish altogether. You know, I've worked with British teenagers for whom attendance didn't really matter and they didn't understand the value of education. But ESOL students, really, my experience has been that they just love coming to the class. They love being there. And for me, if they're not there, it means that there's something that is really genuinely preventing them from attending. Sorry, any comments on this? I think we've come to the end of the session now. Um, so just going to review really quickly what we've done. Uh, if I can find, if I can find my presentation somewhere, we had a look at um, we had a look at ways to identify. Sorry, am I sharing my screen now or not? No. Okay. We had a look at how. Uh, we can identify and we had a look at some strategies for supporting. Will the PowerPoint be available? Yes, if you missed the beginning. Uh, if I can find the PowerPoint actually. Can you share your screen? Yes. So
So really quickly, we um, the aims and objectives of the session was to have a look at, sorry, I need to move this and close this, was to have a look at a legal, institutional, circumstantial and societal setting. A lot of really big words, but I think we had a look at how a range of factors can actually affect people with mental health come there, whether it's financial situation, whether it's circumstances from their own background, whether they're refugees, they've been tortured, etc. We had a look at some strategies um, and ways to, to support. And my main one is everyone's okay, really. Um, and it's not about having a, a, a mental health lesson and it being in isolation. And we've heard from the people in the room um, about their own experience. So, yes, there's some links um, which I've put in um, in the um, PowerPoint, which Katina has now, which will be shared with everyone. Any more questions before we end this session? Comments, thoughts? Okay, I... I think I'd just like to say that um, I think I'm going to take a more holistic approach to my teaching things to find out a lot more about, <laughs> about my learners and things, yeah. Um, and not just look at the, well, you can't do this because this is the law of Scotland, to, to find out more how, how about people feel about themselves, feel about others, and uh, just take a, a wider approach. Fantastic. What a great outcome. Ha <laughs> ha. Very nice. Any other comments or thoughts? I hope you found it useful. Okay. It looks like that might be it. I need you to um, hand back to me or I'll take it back from you. Let me just claim it so I can stop the recording. And I just wanted to um, say thank you again to everybody for coming, but also to um, remind everybody that we have this whole raft of these webinars going on until the 30th of October. And some of them including this one but some of them are really really very special there is one on thursday from mark brown who some people who follow uh, mental health blogs will know as mark one in four and we have um, some amazing ones next week which will include looking at um, how you might use systems learning um, across your organizations uh, systems thinking across all of your organizations uh, to kind of influence uh, mental health leadership across the piece so um, I really would encourage you and welcome you to come to those. And right at the end, we'll be launching a sort of new look mental health website. Um, so it's this, but with a new kind of makeover. And there was a webinar very bravely being done by the project coordinator at Barnsley um, at Northern College. And she's going to share the experience they've had of running the biz pilot there. And in particular, the retreat that they held for um, a long weekend, which I went to. Um, we started at 3.30 on a Friday afternoon and on Saturday breakfast was at 10 past eight and our first classes were at 9.15. And um, they went on till 10 o'clock at night. I was still doing creative writing at 10 at night on Saturday. Sunday we got a lie-in and classes didn't start till 9.45. Um, and they finished in the middle of the afternoon. And that was a real lesson learned um, for Northern College and that very bravely, they're happy to um, share that with everybody. So thank you to everybody else for their thanks. Please do come to the other sessions because we don't know when we'll get the chance again to do something like this. Okay, thank you. I just